Hello, in this video we talk about PERMA suppressed redstone dust. What PERMA uh, suppressed redstone dust means is that we have redstone dust right here and this is an update suppressor. So uh, for example if I place some blocks right here and I put a torch here and the redstone dust here is in X direction while the torch is in Z direction and I destroy the block then this torch doesn't pop off because the updates first went to the redstone dust and then it just updates the press and then this torch never popped off. And this is now true for all redstone dust in this world and it's true until the server restarts. Um, uh, that's uh, what perma suppressed redstone dust is. And in this video I will explain how you can get uh, perma suppressed redstone dust. So to get perma suppressed redstone dust you need a contraption right here. And I will now show you how to operate this contraption and then you can get perma su um, suppressed redstone dust as well. I will now explain how you can get perma suppressed redstone dust. I will give two explanations. First I will explain how you can get it using commands if you are on a carpet server. So in the description you can download carpet mod and I will now quickly show you how you can get perma suppressed redstone dust using carpet mod. And after that I will show a survival friendly setup for getting perma suppressed redstone dust. So if you have carpet mod then you can use the command uh, async beacon updates. Um, to um, make it so that every time a beacon gets powered it sends out async block updates and then um, you can uh, like make async observer chains but in this case we actually uh, want not an async observer chain but an async uh, observer water chain which has alternating water and uh, observers and uh, you want it to go either in plus set or minus set direction so let me quickly first place um, some glass around here um, And then let's fill this up with water. And I've already got instant scheduling on. I should maybe first turn it off while I'm building this. And after you have the water in here, you uh, make every second um, block an observer. And this is then an observer water chain. And the special things about observer water chains is that they um, can have multiple async threads in them. Like if you have an observer chain, you can have, can have one async thread in the observer chain, while if you have an observer water chain, you can have multiple async threads in them at the same time. And uh, right here at the end, we want to split something slightly different. We put here a second water block, and then we put here some blocks and wiggle around these observers like this, and at the end, we produce redstone. And what this will do is, if you have multiple async threads in this line, then uh, there will always be two async threads managing to go to the redstone. And if two different threads manage to access the redstone at the same time and turn it on and off then usually both of them will crash and the idea behind perma suppressed redstone dust is um, if a lot of async threads crash um, in the redstone code then at some point the redstone becomes permanently broken and turns into an update suppressor so after we've built this we now need to turn on instant scheduling and we already have async beacon updates and now you just flick this lever 20 times. Every time you flick this lever you create a new async thread and uh, whenever there are two um, async threads in this line uh, they will go to the redstone and crash with each other. So after, um, yeah, I think I flicked this enough and now um, the redstone dust is probably perma suppressed. So let's, let's try this. So um, let's put this uh, within X direction here and if I now break this block you can see this lever doesn't uh, pop off because the redstone dust is now an update suppressor. So um, this is how you can get perma suppressed redstone dust uh, using carpet commands. So I will now explain uh, how to get perma suppressed redstone dust in survival. Um, so in the world, uh, in the video description, you can find a world download for this world right here. Um, and uh, you should put your view distance to 10 and you can then go to these coordinates to, um, to go to the actual setup. Okay, so here we are at the player platform um, and here there are a lot of signs and the signs have numbers and you should flick the levers corresponding to the signs uh, in the correct order. Um, also, um, I will use carpet to uh, find out when the autosave happens. So uh, if you do lock autosave and you press tab, you can see the autosave uh, up there. And uh, you should not do things right before an autosave, but like um, like when you flick a lever, there should always be a few seconds before the next autosave happens. Um, you know. um, also in carpet mode we have the chunk debug tool so we can look at this. So the first lever I've just flicked uh, loads the, the perm loader which is this diagonal right here and the second one loads a rectangle containing cluster chunks and now we quickly need to wait for an autosave so that um, in the cluster chunks um, all the unimportant chunks unload again. So right now we got the autosave and now here all the chunks unload again except for the 
cluster chunks, which are actually the, the important chunks. Okay. Um, now, after we unloaded the cluster chunks, we need to downsize the chunk cache map. If you're a single player, you can do this by walking into this nether portal and then walking back out again before an autosave happens. If you're in multiplayer, you can just relock. Um, so now the chunk cache map should be downsized. Okay. Next up, you um, either ender pearl against these uh, emerald blocks if you're in single player, or if you're in multiplayer, you can just walk here and uh, relock. Okay. And now we wait for an autosave, and after that we do uh, 5, 6, and 7 um, the buttons. Um, so this one here is um, quite important. This one turns on instant tile ticks. Um, let me quickly look at this. Like this loads these chunks here, and now instant tile ticks are on. And after you did this, you should within a single autosave also flick this lever. This will create a lag spike, and you should walk through here and press this button before the lag spike is over. Um, you can tell whether the lag spike is over by whether this piston extends or not. Like at the end of the lag spike, this piston extends. Um, okay, it crashed the game. Like uh, I should mention, this this contraption is very crashy. So um, let's. Um, but that's live, right? Um, let's let's look at the crash report. What 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 was it actually? Oh, it's uh, a crash in the carpet chunk debug tool. Okay, so so maybe you should turn off the carpet chunk debug tool because it um, this thing can crash your carpet uh, chunk debug tool. Um, so yeah, um, that's something to keep in mind. Let's so let's try this again. Um, and this time we try it without uh, carpet chunk debug tool because that increases the amount of question is, but we will still use the lock autosave. So let's go to the platform. Let's wait for an autosave. So here we have an autosave. Let's turn on the permaloader. Let's turn on the cluster chunks. Let's wait for another autosave. So the cluster chunks should now be loaded. Um, then let's go over to this cobble wall and relock. And the relogging will um, downsize the chunk cache map and enter us in the correct position here. Um, and yeah, that should be enough time to do the rest, right? So let's do this. And now we wait for this piston to extend and then we flick this lever. Okay. Now we, let's flick this lever and hope that the redstone dust permit suppresses. This looks good. Yeah, I think there's redstone dust permit suppressed because it's not turning off anymore. Okay, and now we have uh, permit suppressed redstone dust. Um, so let's see this. So this is an X direction. So if I um, put a torch here, break this when we have a floating torch. Yeah. So um, this time it worked. We now have permit suppressed redstone dust. Um, yeah. So sometimes it takes a few tries, but this is the survival setup. Okay, I'm now in the inactive version of the world download. So in the world download, there's an active and an inactive version of the contraption. And in the inactive version of the contraption, you can actually teleport to the contraption and look at it. Uh, so this is the actual contraption right here. Um, so um, in the active version of this world download, this chunk right here is unpopulated. And uh, like all the stained glass here and the dragon eggs on top and the beacons down here are in an uh, unpopulated chunk. So to build this, you need to make this chunk invisible and then place beacons uh, in an invisible chunk on the chunk border. Um, but uh, making this chunk invisible isn't difficult because um, also in the active setup, like this chunk here is ungenerated and this uh, uh, stone formation here is just to make the other chunk invisible. Like um, it's part of a setup that this chunk becomes invisible and then it's easy to place the beacons in there. Um, so uh, what actually happens in here, uh, what this is, is an unload chunk swap setup. And um, to understand unload chunk swaps, I recommend watching Falling Block episode 3. I will uh, link this in the video description. And the only difference is that instead of um, placing stained glass in the player face from a player, we uh, use dragon eggs on top. Um, so we have here uh, floating dragon eggs. And uh, on the player platform, once instant tile ticks and instant falling are on, we can like uh, activate all this uh, thing and update three spring eggs and they will fall down in the player face. Um, and then they will start always in glass threads. The glass threads will go down until they hit, uh, hit the beacons. And the important thing is that the beacons have a synchronized block and the player phase of a tick has the same kind of synchronized block. So once the stained glass thread uh, hits the beacon, the stained glass thread will wait until the player phase is over. And this allows us to use all the dragon eggs to destroy all the stained glass 
um, while all the stained glass threads still uh, are still alive. So, so like it takes a lot of time to destroy all the stained glass, but all the stained glass threads wait until we have actually destroyed all the stained glass. And when we have all this uh, stained glass threads here, uh, when the player phase um, stops, uh, uh, it's over. And uh, with all these stained glass threads, like we have so much stained glass here, and we also have um, thousand cluster chunks clustering this chunk. Um, with this, we get a lot of unload chunk swaps once we get to the unload phase. So um, in the player phase, we um, on the player platform, we will walk over a chunk border and unload a chunk, and this, uh, the chunk has the same hash as this chunk. And then we get unload chunk swaps. And in this contraption, we don't just get a single unload chunk swaps, but you, we usually get 20 to 30 unload chunk swaps at the same time. And um, this chunk here is unpopulated on disk and it's safe stated. And then every of these uh, 20 unload chunk swaps will trigger an async Taiwan population. So with this setup, when it's working correctly, you get 20 to 30 async Taiwan populations uh, at the same time. And that's uh, very much chaos because like all these async threads would uh, set blocks at the same time. But now we use the next trick. Uh, we use a, a structure here. The nice thing about structures is that structure population is synchronized. So if one async thread uh, populates the stronghold, um, then no other async thread can populate the stronghold at the same time. So in the setup, we get 20 um, async populations at the same time, but uh, they only one of them will um, populate the stronghold while the other ones wait. And when it populates the stronghold, it will go into this observer waterline and go into this redstone over here. And while the first uh, async thread that does have a population is in the redstone over here, all the other async threads that did an async population are waiting until the first async thread is over, basically. That's, what the, that's why we're using a stronghold here. And uh, the first async thread will go into this redstone and uh, turn it on and off. And on the player platform, we will also have a player flicking a lever, turning on the redstone on and off. And uh, when uh, the async thread does this and the main thread does this at the same time, then both threads will crash. Now, since we um, did the thing on the player platform in the player phase, the flicking the lever, uh, it will not shout down the server, but the server will just continue. But the async thread is dead. And every time we crash an async thread in this way, there is a small chance that redstone does become further suppressed. Now, once the first async thread is dead, what will happen is that um, like the first async thread no longer populates the stronghold. So the second async thread that did a Taiwan population will now start populating the stronghold and all the other async populations will still wait. It will go into the redstone dust and we can crash it with um, the redstone which we have on the player platform. And once the second async thread is dead, the third async thread comes and goes through this async line and goes into the redstone. And this continues until redstone dust is perma suppressed. And as soon as the redstone dust is perma suppressed, all the other threads will also just populate the stronghold, go through here, go into the redstone dust, die. And when the next one comes, um, populates the stronghold, goes through here, goes into redstone dust and dies. So once the Western dust is perma suppressed, all the other async threads which did Taiwan populations will just kill themselves instantly and then, then everything is cleaned up. So that's the basic idea behind the setup. Um, yeah, and I will not explain it in more detail. If you want m to understand more, you can like go on the Threadstone Discord and ask me questions or something. Uh, yeah, that's, that's everything about this setup. So here I've got some nice PowerPoint slides um, about Western perma suppression. So if two threads turn on Redstone and on or off at the same time, then they usually both die because the redstone has a hash map which stores which positions it wants to update. And if both threads um, change the hash map at the same time, then they both die in a concurrent modification exception. So usually redstone is pretty useless for redstone because if you put an async line into redstone and then also activate redstone on the main thread, then it, the async thread is just dead. And then you lost your async thread and you don't want that, right? Um, but every time this happens, every time you kill an async thread in, in the redstone dust, there's a small chance that redstone dust becomes permanently broken and becomes uh, permanent suppressed and um, once it's perma suppressed it's an update suppressor and every update which goes to the redstone dust uh, throws an exception. Uh, the same thing also applies to redstone torches. You can break redstone torches in a similar way but redstone dust is more useful because the redstone torch only then throws an exception when it um, executes its tile tick while the redstone dust uh, suppresses every single update. Um, so if you turn off instant tile ticks, then, then the redstone dust is still an update suppressor. While if you turn off instant tile ticks, then the redstone, the torches uh, are just a way to crash your server without doing any serious update suppression. Um, yeah, so that's um, credits. Uh, this thing was discovered by MXI. Uh, he has a YouTube channel called The Crafting Federation, so you can check him out. Um, and the survival setup I just showed is something I built myself. And I also want to thank Lucas Wills for uh, helping me test an early version of my survival setup. Um, then uh, this 
this uh, is a new, completely new Threadstone paradigm because usually in Threadstone we just create one or two async observer lines and then do some clever and elegant race conditions. But this is now the new Threadstone paradigm of Kamikaze Threadstone where you create 20 or 30 async observer lines and then you crash them into a data structure and kill off all the async lines while doing this and you do this until the data structure is broken. So this, this is the new idea here. Now um, what we are doing here might be operating system dependent like all my tests were on Windows um, and MXI uh, told me that uh, this actually doesn't work on Linux that he tried it on Linux and it didn't work. Um, so um, I haven't tested it myself, so, so I'm not really sure, but maybe it depends on operating system, maybe it's just some Java thing. I don't really know what the thing is, but at least um, on Windows with the usual Java version for 112 it works. Uh, yeah. And then uh, next up, this is a cross-world mechanic. Um, if you do this in single player, and you then change your single player world to a different single player world, then the Western does is still perma suppressed. Um, and then the question is, are cross-world mechanics cheating? Like, uh, if you have a legitimate survival world and you promise to press Western dust and then you go into a different survival world and exploit it to get easy update suppression, is this cheating or not? And in my opinion, it's not cheating um, to, to use cross-world mechanics as long as the world it originates from is a legitimate survival world. So it would be cheating if you um, make a creative world and update to, uh, um, promise to press Western dust in a creative world and then go into a survival world and use that. That would be cheating, but if you do it in a legitimate survival world, then I think it's 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 okay. That's my opinion, but this only applies to single player anyway, so you can do what you want. Like it's like on server service doesn't work anyway. Um, it's only cross world for for single player worlds. Uh, so yeah, that's everything in this video. Bye.